afternoon. Welcome to the conference. My name is uh, Phil Tangi. I'm with the uh, Bimbo State Tribal Council, and I'm a Class Two wastewater treatment operator, as well as a Class Three water plant operator. I'm an applied science technologist. I'll give you a little bit of background about myself and what uh, what I think may qualify me to to deliver this presentation on septic systems. I've been in the industry for approximately 17, 18 years. I used to work for Metro Toronto as a wastewater plant operator. I spent a few years there. And after that, I uh, moved on to Xenon Environmental, where I, I traveled extensively commissioning, servicing water and wastewater plants. 33 different countries. You might have noticed in my bio that um, I was in receipt of a, a Department of National Defense's a civilian medal, and that was for working on a wastewater system in Kabul, Afghanistan, on behalf of uh, DND. And that was back in 2003 and in 2005. And from there, I've worked on primarily membrane wastewater filtration systems and drinking water systems. I've worked on membrane wastewater systems on cruise ships all around uh, the globe, sailed almost all the, probably five of the seven seas <laughs> that are out there. And uh, I started with the Bimose Tribal Council in 2009, had a brief stint with the Ontario First Nations Tactical Services Corporation. And I was asked recently to do a presentation on septic systems for the housing conference and for y'all. And so here we are, septic systems, classification, operation, and maintenance. It's quite a bit that goes into wastewater. So first of all, I'll outline what the presentation is going to be about. Bear with me while I turn on my, uh, my clicker here. There we go. You have to hold it down for like three seconds or so. So I'll talk a little bit first of all about the history of septic systems. We'll define what wastewater treatment is, the types of sept septic systems that are out there and the terminology associated with wastewater and septic systems, as well as uh, classifications of septic systems. I understand that uh, Amy Montgomery from Health Canada, she did a presentation this morning, and I, I believe she may have covered briefly some of, these, some of these topics. I'll go into a little more detail. And I'd like to encourage everybody to uh, ask questions. Please don't be afraid to uh, ask questions. If I could answer them, I, I most certainly will. If I can't, I'll ask Chris. Or, some, or I could find the answer somewhere, somehow. <laughs> Back to the outline. We'll talk about the O&M, operation and maintenance of septic systems. And then we'll go into troubleshooting. When things go wrong, and then there will be an open period for questions and answers again at the end of it all. How many people here work with septic systems currently? Okay, so you have some on your community, but uh, you don't work directly with them. That's uh, it's probably about a third of everybody that's here, not more. So then you're going to be partially familiar with what I'm going to be talking about here. So get right into the history. Believe it or not, sewage treatment is a relatively new concept. It originated in Italy quite some time ago, a couple hundred years ago. But over in North America, it's, it's relatively new. And not that long ago, guess what, what cities did with the majority of the wastewater? And I think some cities actually still do that. Halifax, most recently, was still, still doing it. Does anybody care to venture a guess? They were dumping it directly to their, their water supplies. That's right. Anybody see any issues with that? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yeah, that's right. Hopefully the water plant intake wasn't uh, down, downstream of where the sewage was being discharged. Well, it's needless to say there are a lot of issues associated with dumping wastewater directly into surface water bodies, lakes, streams. Any place where your drinking water, raw water supply comes in. Welcome to Septics 101. And here's a couple of photos of uh, discharging into surface water bodies. It's yummy. Now why do we do it? What's the main concern <laughs> with, uh, with wastewater being dumped into a, a, your potential drinking water supply? The main concern, does anybody know? Illness, Illness? that's right. More specifically, you risk, pardon? Yeah, that's part of it. it. It destroys the environment and it endangers public health. More specifically with regards to public health, there is the, uh, the risk of what we call cross-contamination. And with cross-contamination, there's the potential introduction of what we call pathogens. Anybody know what pathogens are? Disease-causing organisms. Disease-causing organisms that originate from warm-blooded animals. And that's exactly what happened in Walkerton. Anybody familiar with Walkerton? The pathogens from uh, feces from cattle got into one of their wells, contaminated the water supply, and uh, the rest is history. Seven people died, a few hundred people got, came ill. All because of pathogens, disease-causing organisms. They include parasites, viruses, bacteria, and we all have them in our gut. One of the biggest is uh, E. coli 154. Everybody has E. coli in, in their stomachs. We require bacteria to break down our food, and it actually it, it works two ways. It helps to keep us healthy, and if it's the wrong bacteria, it can make you sick. People with weak immune systems, they risk illness, and the young and the elderly are particularly vulnerable. In the year 1900, the average North American died at the ripe old age of 47. And that was primarily because of the illnesses in the water. The water was contaminated with bacteria, viruses, protozoa, worms. These are microscopic images of uh, bacteria well, that's obviously a worm. There's a bacteria, bacterium there that's a virus. Just to give you some idea of what they look like. Scientists say one of the greatest advances in modern times was the advent of sewage treatment. But before we talk about sewage treatment, it's good to understand um, a little bit about how the water cycle works because Mother Nature has holds the key to, all, all, to just about everything. But when we turn to nature for answers, we generally tend to find solutions to our problems. So understanding the water cycle. That helps to understand what a, why a proper system is important, a proper, proper wastewater treatment system. Water evaporates comes back down in the form of rain or snow. And it not only recharges lakes, rivers, and oceans, it also infiltrates down through the soil to recharge shallow and deep water tables. And soil, as we all know, acts as a filter, cleaning the supply. And the deeper it goes, the cleaner the water gets. That's why groundwater sources are the most pristine of sources. If it's a true groundwater source, and there are different types of groundwater sources. There's what we call a true groundwater source, once again, and another that we call goodies. A goody is a groundwater that's under the direct influence of surface water. And that poses problems because there's potential for contamination when you have surface water leaking into your groundwater supply. In the old days, People built a house. They also needed water and a place to do their business. 
So here we have a picture of a well and a couple of mock outhouses. One for the roosters, <laughs> rams and bucks and hens, ewes and does. And you can see here in the old days when they dug their wells, they dug them relatively close to home. You didn't want to have to walk a quarter of a mile to go and get your water, nor to go and use the, do your business. So they installed their, own, their homes or their cesspools, holes in the ground for their feces, relatively close to where the well water supply was. And you can see how over time, there'd be contamination would leach down into the groundwater supply and would contaminate, potentially contaminate the well. And here's another shot of that, another photo depicting the same thing. So in the old days, in the early 1900s, the way people used water changed dramatically with the advent of, of indoor plumbing. What they'd do is they'd pipe their wastewater from inside the house and they'd discharge it to a receiving body of water or directly to a, a cesspool. And the, the use of outhouses slowly dwindled away other than people's cottages and camps and that sort of thing. Older piping systems. People used to draw their water from the wells using buckets. But now we don't, we don't have to do that. Because we have piped water going into our homes. So getting, getting the water to the house was easy. Getting it out posed a real problem back in the old days. Many ran a straight pipe out to a ditch, a river, lake. And as it stands today, there are still quite a few homes that are doing exactly that. What are some of the negatives of older piping systems? Well, there'd be the formation of pools of sewage, which are dangerous to, to people and animals, once again, because of the pathogens, the risk for cross-contamination. There were breeding grounds for mosquitoes, more people have died from mosquito spread disease than all of the wars combined. And sewage is high in nutrients. Nutrients found in human waste, soap, and nutrients in surface water promotes excess plant and algae growth. And we're starting to see more and more of that as, as the climate changes, as it warms up. We're seeing more algae blooms, more of the Great Lakes and the shallow waters. There's actually uh, toxic algae out there now called blue-green algae. So it's posing a real problem to our natural environment. Old wells were rarely decommissioned properly, resulting as, direct, as a direct conduit to the underground drinking water. And another negative is that they just they smelt bad. Here's a, an old photograph of outhouses outside of people's homes. Now an outhouse is basically a, uh, a building over a hole in the ground, as we all know. And a hole in the ground is classified as a, a cesspool. Cesspools are pits dug near a house. Wastewater was flushed into the cesspool where it leached down through the bottom and out through the sidewalls. The deeper the cesspool was, the more wastewater it could handle. So there wasn't a lot of thought that went into processing it and what happened after it left the house. Even today, you ask most people, what happens when you flush your toilet? And not everybody knows the answer. The effects of cesspools on surface water They're often dug into shallow water tables, and there's that risk of cross-contamination. And they call that a non-point pollution, like runoff 
things such as runoff, uh, cross-contamination as a result of cesspools, that's considered non-point pollution. Shallow water tables feed the surface waters. If you ask most people what the purpose of a septic system is, they'll say that it's to dispose of your wastewater. Does anybody agree with that? Why do we treat wastewater? Is it to dispose of the wastewater? Well, if you agree, happen to agree with that, you'd be wrong. Because it's actually, what you're doing is you want to render the wastewater useless and you want to make it safe so that it can be discharged to the natural environment. There's been a lot of university uh, research on, on how to achieve that. Back in the old days, how do we, how do we neutralize wastewater? So according to the research, many community leaders were, were content to ignore the problem at one time. And they focused entirely on growth, the growth of the population, constructing homes. They believed that it was only a temporary problem because eventually sewage treatment facilities would be built. So they didn't want to address it at the time. However, a few people began to realize that something had to be done sooner than later. And the smarter solution would be to improve their existing systems rather than waiting for wastewater treatment facilities to be built. And as part of that initiative, septic systems came into being. So why improve? Why was it necessary to improve? Aside from public health, is economics. Everything boils down to the, uh, the almighty dollar. You know, people's um, tourists, for example, when they went on vacation, they didn't want to go to an area where it smelled bad. They wanted to go to areas that were pristine, that were enjoyable. They wanted to know that the water that they were going to be swimming in, fishing in, was safe, and that the fish they caught, they'd be able to eat. So improving on-site wastewater systems became a priority. Now some of the ideas that they came up, came up with for improving wastewater treatment, septic systems, were the type of soils that wastewater would flow into, or wastewater effluent. The types of mechanical filters, removing the solids, bacteria, they discovered that bacteria on the top of soil assisted dramatically in neutralizing nutrients, harmful pathogens in wastewater. Consumptions of parasites and viruses present in excrement. You know, these are all things that they discovered through research and analysis because they were forced to. One of the keys to, to uh, effective soil management or pathogen elimination on the soil was keeping your soil shallow. The pathogens like to stay up near the surface. They, they breed, they live up near the surface of, of the soil. And then Mother Nature came to the rescue. Mother Nature naturally treats animal feces by putting bacteria on the top soil. If you were to pick up a tablespoon of dirt from the yard, you'd find four to five million bacteria in, in that one tablespoon of dirt. And bacteria eat harmful, nasty organisms and, and feces. A septic system harnesses Mother Nature's way of cleaning up after animals by utilizing these bacteria and assisting the treatment process happening just under the surface of the soil. A typical 1970 septic system design, it comprised mainly of two parts. There was a tank, and then there was a, a drain fill. The piping, in, piping is the transportation conduit for wastewater to travel through to the tank as well as out to the drain field. Tanks 
what they allowed to have happen was for the solids to settle out, and tanks would also separate the solids, and they would act as a, act as a uh, storage component for solids. And they still do today. The typical drain field is, is a trench or a bed, generally 15 centimeters to 90 centimeters in depth of gravel. Today they're generally made up of plastic pipe, which is placed on top of the gravel. And more gravel is placed over the pipe and covered with a permeable barrier. And that's used to prevent the topsoil from migrating down and clogging up the gravel. Has anybody ever installed a septic system? Or been involved in an installation? There's a few guys. So you, just, you know what's involved. Here's an illustration of a, an older style septic system. You can see there's the, the tank there. This tank is used for storage, settling. And the effluent, after it's settled, travels over to the drain field. And you can still see that there was an issue with the drain field too. It's leaching down into the groundwater. There's a potential for that to happen. And there was an evaporation going on as well. What are some of the uh, design limitations for septic systems? Older septic systems, they worked well under ideal conditions. And not all sites were ideal. One of the main concerns or the main determinations of where you're going to build a septic system is, is the surrounding soil, and the elevation, the geographical location. You know, the high water tables could create issues. Slow soils that won't percolate. Soils that perk too fast. The effluent has to move through soil slowly enough to ad for adequate treatment to take, take place for the bacteria to consume the pathogens in the water. There could be a lack of soil, and that's a common problem that we, we have in First Nations is there's a lot of rocky areas where there's a lack of soil. So the drainage field has to be uh, built up. Or there may, may be uh, nearby bodies of water where more through nutrient removal might be necessary. For example, a, uh, a water body that's fairly shallow. And through uh, the release of nutrients into that shallow water body and photosynthesis, you're going to get extensive algae growth. It's all things to consider. But through further research, trial and error, most of these limitations were resolved. Necessity being the mother of invention, solutions for the problems were developed. The mound system resolved issues such as high water tables, and slow perking soils. And the mound system seems to be most prevalent today than uh, one of the more common systems that we see everywhere, not only in First Nations, but everywhere. Different materials are being used for systems. There's sand filters, there's peat filters, aerobic systems that are being used. There's the uh, shallow drip irrigation systems. And there's also constructive wetlands, which provide necessary treatment when the existing site won't do. These are all forms of wastewater treatment, modern wastewater treatment, or what we like to call alternative systems. Some of the negatives with alternative systems is that they tend to cost more than basic systems. However, they're still cheaper than building a, a wastewater treatment facility. And the hookup fees may be in the thousands of dollars, and new septic systems generally run anywhere from 10 to 20,000, and that varies. And septic systems are relatively inexpensive to, to operate per year. It's cheaper than paying for a, a wastewater collection tax. What are some of the modern system issues? 
Many abandoned cesspools were never filled in. And you can see how that could be a problem. You know, if areas might be aband abandoned, homes abandoned, cesspools, so it all becomes growing in. And people are there hiking, they're out on a nature walk. And cesspool opening might be covered in, they might not even see it, and they'll walk right into it. And it's not a question of whether they're going to collapse. Like concrete doesn't last forever. It's, it's a matter of when. When will they collapse? What are other system issues that we faced with? Cesspools still are being used. And uh, they're still waiting for the big pipe. That being the wastewater collection pipe or laterals. If you fall into an active cesspool, your chances of getting out alive could go down considerably. Some other issues include codes and bylaws that exist today. Because you can't just go out and, and build yourself a septic system. You have to adhere to the, uh, the regulations and laws that are out there. And grandfathering old systems. Don't worry about that old septic system. It's grandfathered. That's the old line that a lot of people say, but that, that no longer applies. Grandfathering no longer applies in just about every industry. Modern wastewater treatment. As it stands right now, there's over 70 municipal wastewater treatment technologies available today. Not to mention those that are industrial wastewater technologies that are available and agricultural wastewater treatment technologies. Septic systems are just one of those 70. There's conventional wastewater treatment, there's membrane bioreactors, rotating biological contactors. Just Google it, you'll see there's several. Wastewater treatment versus water reclamation. The phrase wastewater treatment is outdated and it's being phased out. They're, they're tend, they tend to call it water reclamation now. Which you're probably uh, some of you here have, have seen that term being used. Because wastewater has got a, a nasty connotation to it. So rather than saying that you're treating wastewater, what we're doing is we're re reclaiming clean water. It's basically saying the same thing, but there are differences. Wastewater treatment defined. It's wastewater treatment is defined as a process that modifies wastewater characteristics such as its biological oxygen demand, that's BOD, that's the amount of oxygen that's found in water. And there has to be a certain amount, a minimum amount of oxygen in water in order for aquatic species to survive, including fish and, and uh, fauna in the water. There's the chemical oxygen demand, pH, it's hydrogen potential. pH is, is measured on, on a, uh, a scale of 0 to 14, 7 being neutral. And Tim probably knows the range, the ultimate range, or the ideal range for, for pH in the water supply. Hey, Tim? <laughs> it's anywhere from 6.5 to 8.5. So th these are things that have to be considered when treating wastewater. Because once again, you want to clean that water up so that you can send it back to the natural environment so that it doesn't do any harm. And also there's effluent standards and regulations have to be adhered to. Here's a typical wastewater treatment plant process. See here that uh, wastewater leaves the municipal environment, goes to pumping stations, into a collection, wastewater collection system, through fine screens at a wastewater treatment plant, through what they call grit chambers, this type of system you're more likely to see in uh, larger municipalities like Thunder Bay, Toronto. Smaller places like Ignace more than likely wouldn't have anything like this. And there's the uh, primary clarifiers, there's the activated sludge, which is a biological process. And that biological process, they utilize microorganisms as well. 
to break down the wastewater. There's secondary clarifiers, nitrification, denitrification, and denitrification. It's used for ammonia removal. Because ammonia in higher concentrations is, is harmful to the natural environment. And this one here, they show that ultraviolet disinfection prior to sending it back to the river. So even wastewater plants uh, utilize disinfection. And disinfection is, is used to kill or neutralize any pathogens that may have been missed in the wastewater treatment process. In Canada, there's approximately 28,800 Section 95 homes on reserves. They're banned, owned, and operated. Many homes are privately owned. Some homes are, homes are connected to wastewater collection systems, which send their municipal wastewater to wastewater treatment plants. Some homes, that, that's where the treatment plants are available. Some homes, though, have septic systems, as we all know. Individual septic systems where they are the sole domestic wastewater contributor. And some homes will discharge their wastewater to a communal septic system, which are those with more than one home discharging the wastewater to a common system. For septic tank systems serving dwellings, sewage is defined as waste or domestic, of domestic origins, which is human body waste, toilet or other bathroom waste, or waste from showers, tubs, kitchens. It could be waterborne kitchen waste or laundry waste. And they break that down into two further definitions. There's something that's called gray water, something that's called black water. Black water is, is the actual solids. Anything that contains solids, such as uh, feces, excrement, that's considered black water. Laundry water, uh, shower water, that's considered gray water. It's different than wastewater treatment plants. A septic tank produces a polluting effluent, which must be discharged to a drainage field for further treatment as compared to a wastewater treatment plant. Septic systems, they do not require day-to-day -day servicing as compared to a wastewater treatment plant. And wastewater treatment plants tend to be more of a mechanical construction and uh, process. A wastewater treatment plant produces a clean, non-polluting effluent, which can be discharged directly into a stream, a ditch, or other water course or to marshlands. The wastewater treatment systems require daily, weekly, monthly, and annual maintenance. So most large, all wastewater, all large wastewater treatment plants, they, they have operators working at them around the clock. 24-7, 365 days a year. This is a typical septic system layout. Here's the septic tank. Flush the toilet, and waste flows into the septic tank where it settles out, it separates. And the effluent, or the supernatant, that's the, the clear part of the, the water that where you've got the solids that settle to the bottom and you've clears the top part of it is more of a supernatant, they call it. It's, it's more of a clear water. It travels to the leaching bed for further treatment. It flows into the leaching bed and the leaching bed, that's where the pathogenic organisms are, are broken down by, by the soil.
That's right. Yeah. Yeah, these are the minimum requirements for, uh, for distances when you're installing a, a septic system. <laughs> And that, that information can be found in the Ontario Building Code, Section 8. Does everybody have a copy of that? Anybody that works with septic systems or installs them? That's kind of like your, your, your Bible in Ontario. Is there, you have a First Nations Illustrated Building Code? It's just Section 8 of the Ontario Building Code that that outlines the requirements for septic systems. There's quite a few, there are several regulations that apply. I don't know if anybody sat in on Amy's presentation this morning. She may have touched upon a few of them. It's all based on flow, as well as the uh, number of occupants in a home, number of rooms. Yes, Vernon? That's right. Do you have a question, Vernon? If you separated the two streams, well, that, that's being done in the septic tank. So when, when you say separate it, do you mean have a, a separate tank for, for gray water only and then a separate tank for, for black water? Not, not necessarily. There wouldn't really be any difference to that other than the only benefit I could think of was that you'd be able to hold more water before you required a pump out or you'd have to, uh, you'd, it, would, it would require more land space. I think there's more disadvantages to doing something like that than there would be advantages. I can't think of any benefits by separating the two. Yeah, unless you were selling one, the black water for something. <laughs> yeah, that's, all, that's, that's what they do with solids. Well, they already are, actually. A lot of, you know, wastewater is just water reclamation, once again. And, and this is what's happening right now on the planet as we speak. They're actually treating wastewater and turning it into potable water supplies in some, some countries. That's, that's going on as we speak. Because water can neither be created nor destroyed. We have an infinite, we do not have an infinite source of, of water. We have a finite source of water. So as the population grows, we're well over 7 billion people on the planet now, coming up to 7.5 billion. As that grows, you know, we're not making any more water. You can't. So we all have to share that water as the population grows. So they're coming up with alter alternative solutions to treating wastewater to make it potable. And that's going on. Not in North America yet. South America, it's happening. But what we are doing in North America, places like, um, like Georgia. I worked on a job down in uh, Pooler, Georgia, just not too far from Atlanta. It was a wastewater membrane bioreactor where they treated municipal wastewater. And then with that effluent, they were selling it to, um, to golf courses. They were reclaiming it. It's big business. You know, it just takes a little further treatment. You can make that water potable. And that, like I say, it's happening in places like South America. Let's talk a little more about terminology. A septic tank, what is a septic tank? Once again, it's a, it is a watertight pretreatment receptacle used for receiving the discharge of sewage from a building, sewer, or sewers. It's designed and constructed to permit separation and settleable and settleability of uh, and floating solids from the liquid. <laughs> Detention and anaerobic digestion of the organic matter prior to discharge of the liquid. What's a drain field? It's 
specifically a conventional drain field. It's a bed or a seepage bed or a leach field. It's an area in which perforated piping is laid in drain, rock packed trenches or excavations. It's the same as seepage beds. And it's for the purpose of distributing, try, you're trying to evenly distribute the effluent from a wastewater treatment unit. Now let's talk about gray water. So that portion of the wastewater stream that originates in sinks, tubs, showers, just a quick little recap. And black water or septage, as it's also known as, that's the waste carried off by the toilet and urinal. Capacity of a septic system. What is the capacity of a septic system? It's the volume of wastewater, which includes both the black water and the gray water, which an on-site septic system must be capable of handling. Typically, capacity is described as daily, a daily volume of wastewater in liters or gallons, and it's a function of the number of building occupants using the facility. It's adjusted for other building activities such as laundry, garbage grinders, or other site activities. So that's where that formula comes into play. Centralized septic systems, what are they? They're on-site wastewater disposal systems which collects waste from multiple barriers or facilities. And it's for treatment and disposal of, uh, at a single site or facility. Centralized septic systems may serve an entire community or a large group of homes such as townhouses or elder complexes. Centralized wastewater and septage disposal Systems are generally associated with large treatment requirements as for an entire community. You don't see too many of these around. Most uh, communities, larger communities, will, would tend to have a, an actual wastewater treatment facility. Sure. Yeah, you could, you could uh, direct wastewater to, to more than one residence and, 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 and use a septic system. More, more, I think as it applies today, it's more, you'll have uh, clusters of uh, septic systems in a community. You might have, so one cluster will, will treat waste from, from five homes and there'll be another cluster that'll treat it from six or seven homes and, and then another one that'll treat it from three or four. That's, I think that's more common than a centralized system that would treat an entire community with a septic system, that is. And anything at over five homes, ANSI, ANDC actually does fund anything with uh, five or more homes. Thanks, Chris, for reminding me. <laughs> Cluster septic systems. That's a type of centralized system. Once again, it serves as few as two homes or just a few homes. Clustered septic systems may be used in a, the development of new homes in which small groups of two or three homes are served by individual wastewater treatment systems. Effluent. What is effluent? Septic system effluent is the, the clarified partially treated Partially treated being the key phrase. Liquid which leaves the septic tank. Does it require any further treatment after it leaves the septic tank? Anybody? Yeah. Everybody, I see everybody's nodding their head, so it, it does require further treatment when it leaves the tank because it's not safe. Remember what we're trying to do with the, with the wastewater or the septic sewage, we're, we're trying to render it harmless for the natural environment. And just coming out of the septic tank doesn't do it. 
We have to, it has to go to a drip field and into the soil where the bacteria and organisms in the soil lead up the, the harmful bacteria and viruses. Large solids have been separated by settlement, by floating, to coagulate in, into grease and scum, or by filtration or other methods. Septic effluent moves out of a septic treatment tank into an, an absorption system or other effluent treatment system for further treatment and ultimate disposal or discharge to the environment. The most common being a, a drain field. Grinder pumps. At one, one time, septic systems relied strictly on gravity. They didn't utilize pumps. Now they have to use pumps. And the most common pump to use for wastewater is, is the grinder pump. The grinder pump, pump is a macerating pump. What that means is just a pump that, that rips everything up. There's sometimes you, you, you will have toilet paper. It's flushed down the toilet. and There may be wipes, even though you're not supposed to put wipes in your septic system. There may be other things, hair, lint, that sort of stuff gets in there. And the maceration process, that just rips it, shreds it into smaller pieces, more manageable sizes. They're capable of grinding up sewage and including the solid waste. So it breaks down the, the feces as well and the excrement. So that the waste product can be pumped at pressure to a treatment system. Grinder pumps are used with force mains generally, septic systems, to move wastewater products uphill to a uh, private on-site wastewater treatment facility. It doesn't have to be private, it could be any wastewater treatment facility or in, in larger installations to, to move sewage or black water or waste products to a centralized treatment facility. Force mains are then used to carry sewage prepared by a grinder pump. Will generally be at a, a smaller diameter than waste lines which work by gravity. So when it's pumped to, a, to another, another tank, they call that a sewage pumping station. That, that, is more common with actual wastewater treatment facilities or wastewater treatment plants and not so much septic systems. Generally with septic systems, you'll, you'll have a second tank. There'll be a grinder pump in there. It'll just transfer the effluent into another tank and from there it overflows into your drain field. Infiltration. Infiltration is the flow or the movement of water into the intersections or the uh, pores of a soil through the soil interface. Infiltrate of surface. In drain fields, the drain rock originally, the drain rock, original soil interface at the bottom of the trench, that's an infiltrate of surface. In the mound systems, the gravel mound sand and the sand original soil interfaces, it's considered the infiltrative surface. In sand line trenches or beds, sand filters, the gravel sand interface and the sand original soil interface at the bottom of the trench or the bed. It's considered the infiltrative surface. Influent. What is influent? Wastewater, partially or completely treated, or in its natural state also called raw wastewater, flowing into a reservoir, a tank, treatment unit, or disposal unit. That's influent. Installers. What's well, an installer? It's a qualified person approved by an, a local health officer or a regula regulator uh, <laughs> or by regulation <laughs> or local government. And they're, co they're qualified and approved to install or repair on-site sewage systems or their components. They do now. They actually do have to be certified. At one time, they didn't. Anybody, anybody that could operate a backhoe at one time could have installed a septic system. But now they have, they have to be certified. 
And that's one of the good things about regulations being brought up to date. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, somebody to point at. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, that's one of the things, I guess. And it also gives you uh, peace of mind that the installer's taken a course. He's, uh, he's had to achieve a, a level of competency, hopefully, that enables him to become an installer, to get his license or a certificate to be an installer. Lift pumps. The lift pump is used to move liquid effluent from a lower pumping chamber or effluent tank to a higher level tank or possibly out of an effluent tank up to a mound system or a sand bed or other elevated effluent treatment system. The sand mound. It's a disposal component in which a specific sand media is placed above the ground surface. After the ground surface has been properly prepared, the effluent from uh, effluent form, it's an effluent form, a treatment component is discharged into a bed above the sand. It's treated by flowing downward through the sand and is discharged directly and into the underlying soil where it's disposed of with some additional polishing that coming from the soil itself. The three main types of septic systems today. The broad types of septic systems, they include conventional gravity systems, mound systems, and advanced treatment systems. And we briefly touched upon some of these thus far in this presentation. Anybody have any idea what the most common might be? Anybody else? The conventional system is actually the most common. Mount systems, they have their pros and their cons. You know, if money was no object, then mount systems would probably be more of those than anything else because they seem to be. You could, you could bring in your soil, the exact type of soil that you need that's going to that's gonna break down your organisms. So you could, you could just hand pick that. It, uh, it's a combination of both. You just uh, you, you dig slightly under the ground, into the ground a little bit. You don't have to go as far. And then you, you build on top of that. Conventional septic systems are the most common. They're also referred to as tile bed systems or leaching bed systems or leaching fields. And there's an example of each it's one on the construction. Gravity systems. Waterborne waste flows to the tank by gravity. And the effluent, the liquid part of the wastewater, it exits the tank to the drain field or to the leach field by gravity. That's more of an older style. Nowadays, most systems use pumps to transfer the effluent. For the gravity systems, no pumps are required, no electricity is required, or mounts. Drain field is a series of perforated underground pipes through which effluent is dispersed so that it can gradually seep into the subsoil. And this all goes on underground. Soil purifies the effluent, returns clean water to the water table. This is exciting stuff, isn't it? <laughs> I don't see anybody sleeping yet, though. That's good. <laughs> Only in staff meetings, yeah. <laughs> Here's an example of a, a mound system. They're large, man-made, above-ground mounds of sand and gravel. They're installed when conventional drain fields won't be adequate. Now this system requires electricity because that uses utilizes pumps to discharge the effluent from a lower elevation to a higher elevation, that being the mound. 
Anybody have any idea where a amount system is more advantageous, or you'd actually you might even need a mount system, and that's the only type of system that you you could use on bedrock. That's right. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Areas where you just can't dig underground because there's there's no soil there. It might be on top of rock or hard clay or something. You'd have no choice but to install a mount system. You can see the wastewater travels into here. There's a baffle. So the effluent transfers over here, flows by gravity down to here, and then it's pumped to the drain field and dispersed. Not a very clear photo. I apologize. No, you'd have an access point. There is an access hatch here. You'd probably have a, a chain or a cable hooked up to the pump so you could pull it out. Yeah. There's an animated photograph or an anim animation of a, a mount system. One of the disadvantages of mount systems is that in a community where there are several of them, they tend to be, become an eyesore. And the thing with mount systems too is you have, to, you have to be aware that they're there. Otherwise, you might park your car there or you might put something on it and that, and that could damage it. So you always got to keep in mind and make your, your guests aware, your visitors aware that you, if you do have a mount system, not to park there. So many people have parked on, on their mounts. I've seen it happen many times, accidentally, just because people don't know about it. And they don't look very attractive either, I don't think. Downside to mounts. They're expensive. They use a lot of resources. They don't work when the power is off, because the pumps will be down. And they're more prone to failure, because there's more components to them. Anything that has a lot of components are more prone to failure than the simple things, such as a gravity system. Advanced treatment systems. There's a wide range of systems or additions to conventional septic systems that would make them advanced treatment systems. There's sand filters, there's aerobic units, trickling biological filters. This one here is an advanced um, aerocell sand filter and wetland package. And what the ad advanced portion of this is that it, it utilizes aeration. There's an aerator inside of there. The air, air, what the air does is it, it breaks down. When you're aerating inside of your septic tank, it helps to break the solids down even further. Oxidation occurs. An example of another advanced treatment system. This one in, incorporates a, a, a treatment step between the solid separation and the final dispersal of the effluent. It has pumps, timers, floats. They're used to control the flow of the wastewater from one compartment of the system to the next. And you can see the, the more components you have to a system, the more likely that one of them may fail. Continuum of less expensive options between a gravity system and the most advanced systems. So that just means you could utilize, uh, you could have an, an existing conventional system and you could add a component to it which would make it an advanced system. If something goes wrong with a gravity system, it doesn't mean you have to automatically go to a, to a mount or a high tech replacement. You could keep that system and just add to it. 
There are steps that can be taken to fix a gravity system without paying big bucks to replace it. Anybody have any questions? Who? Oh, Vernon. It's a secret. <laughs> as long as they're working, you know, as, as long as they're working, then there's nothing wrong with that. EHO, that's right. I know, I know where Andy. Right. Well, I take a look at, at why they're overflowing right now. Is, is it because they're, they're uh, being used beyond their capacity? Or is it because they're, they're, they're clogged? So then, then you would have to expand upon those fields then. You might need a, a larger tank and, and a larger field. Because if, if it were originally designed for one family and you're using three families then you're overloading it. You're hydraulically overloading that wastewater treatment system. So it would definitely require an upgrade and expansion. Oh, well, th they vary. Most wastewater treatment systems, including septic systems, are designed to last 20 years. Some will last longer, some won't last as long. It all boils down to operation and maintenance, how well you take care of it too. And we'll touch upon that. You've installed systems before. To your knowledge, do you know of any systems that uh, have lasted up to 20 years or beyond 20 years? Actually, quite a few. Quite a few, so. And they're working well, and they're over 20 years old. Yeah, it's not, as long as you're not overloading it, that's right. So they're, they're designed for 20 years, but you might get 30 or 40 out of them. Or you may only get 10. Depends on, on the maintenance and, and the load. If you're overloading it, and you know, there's, there's nothing you can do. If, if it can't accommodate the size of the load, it's, you're, you're going to end up with um, contamination. Right. I know a lot of systems too right now, they, um, they allow extra space when they're installing a new system, a septic field or drain field. They allow extra space for future expansion and, and for such things as this gentleman here just indicated. So it'll, it'll seep in, into the, uh, the drain field, but that drain field is, is larger than normal size, so you've got that more surface area, which will uh, further treat that that effluent going into the drain field. But on average, I would say 20 years, Vernon, is life expectancy. 
and I never went to university, sorry. <laughs> Only college. Common septic systems. There's a couple of diagrams of some of the common septic systems look like. Got a tank, distribution box, this one here. So this is where the separation, the settling goes on. And this is where it's distributed to your, your field, to your leaching bed, through the leaching bed pipes. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the laws and regulations that apply. The Passage of Service Improvement Act came out in 1997. It was a proclamation of Schedule B to that act. It became law April 6, 1998. That transferred the regulation of smaller septic systems from Part 8 of the Environmental Protection Act to the Building Code, 1992. Unreserved wastewater treatment systems are designed and operated in accordance with the Ontario Building Code specifications today. Any new ones that are, are constructed will follow the Ontario Building Code specifications. There's wastewater system effluent regulations which were developed under the Fisheries Act in 2010. They're designed to protect receiving bodies of water and they apply mainly to Systems that discharge in excess of 100 cubic meters of wastewater per day or effluent per day, which is, say, uh, 100,000 liters. You won't find too many septic systems, if any, that are capable of, of treating that type of uh, demand. Canada and other applicable provincial or territorial requirements may apply. And as always, the most stringent regs are the ones that govern. That applies to water, that applies to everything. Water, wastewater, you name it. The Ontario Building Code has been revised. Part 8 regulates the installation and operation of septic systems. Wastewater system effluent regulations. Oh, sorry. The smaller septic systems have a design flow of less than 10,000 liters a day. It's 10 cubic meters a day. The system is located wholly on the lot and the building, lot of the building which the uh, system serves. See, prior to Part 8 of the Ontario Building Code, regulatory provisions related to septic sewage systems were administered by boards of health or regional and district health units. Did Amy talk about any of this this morning? I missed her presentation. <laughs> so also previously enforced by the boards of health of the regional and district health units. Today, municipal chief building officials and their inspection enforce the regulation, their inspectors. Legislation now is a requirement for the uh, testing and licensing of installers of sewage systems. So you have to be licensed to be an installer. Prior to the enactment of, a, of the new provision in Part 2 of the Building Code, there, there wasn't any requirement. So anybody could have installed a system. Anybody that knew how to operate a backup? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, and yet they still didn't install them after they, after they've hit them with tobacco and damaged it. They were still installed. <laughs> Part eight of the building code, it sets out five different classes of septic systems in a uniform and detailed fashion. The regulations describes these systems, and they make provision for such matters such as uh, clearances of the systems. 
from uh, bodies of water, depth requirements, anchorage of septic tanks and holding tanks. They have to be firmly anchored into the ground. There are new requirements for training of inspectors that are outlined. Plus requirements for the testing and licensing of installers, once again. And a more regulated regime to govern septic systems under the building code, which provides greater protection for ground and surface waters for the natural environment, more so now than, than ever before. Part 8 of the code sets out the five different classes of septic systems. 8.1.2.1 classifies the systems. All sewage systems shall be classed as one of the following. A class 1 system is generally a chemical toilet, an incinerating toilet, a recirculating toilet, a self-contained portable toilet, and all forms of privy including a portable privy, an earth pit privy, a pail privy, a privy vault, and a composting toilet type of system. Do you like the word privy? Class twos are generally associated with gray water systems. Class threes are cesspools, deal with cesspools. Fours. Class four, that's one of the more common types of systems. That's a classification that we see more so in First Nations than anything else, are the class fours. Those are the ones that regulate septic tanks and leaching beds. Or a class five system that requires or uses a holding tank for the retention of hauled sewage at the site where it's produced prior to the collection by a hauled sewage system. So that's where you'd have your, your septic truck going in. So a class 5 system is just a tank where it's a holding tank. That's it. There is no, no drain field associated with it. The Building Code Act allows municipalities to enter into agreements with uh, upper tier municipalities. So you could have municipal transfer agreements with um, a First Nation and a community. For example, there's uh, Tayendinaga. Does anybody know where Tayendinaga is? It's a, a Mohawk community just outside of, uh, where is it? I think it's just outside of Belleville, Belleville, Ontario. It's in Southern Ontario. Tayendinaga has a, uh, a municipal, an MTA with uh, Deserano, the town of Deseronto. Deserano receives all of Tandanega's waste wastewater. And Deserano also supplies Tandanega with their drinking water. And they're not the only ones that have a, an MTA. They're, they exist all across the country. Provinces mandated that this be done in uh, Northern Ontario. That's, uh, let's see, allows agreements with certain agencies such as conservation authorities or health boards to have these other bodies administer the provisions of the building code as to sewage systems, okay. And the province mandate that that has to be done in Northern Ontario. The section 2.15.1.1 has been added to the Ontario Building Code designating particular northern health boards and a conservation authority as the responsible bodies. So what do we need to know when uh, operating and maintaining septic systems? The way you treat your septic system will influence how long it's going to last and how well it works. If you own or rent a property served by an on-site sewage system, you need to think about how your actions will affect the system. You need to be careful about what substances you flush down the toilet or the drain. 
Consider how often your septic tank is cleaned out and inspected. Your decisions will impact the effectiveness of the septic system. And bad decisions can, can become expensive and take a, a great deal of time to correct. And there's always the potential to harm the natural environment or public health by polluting lakes or contaminating drinking water sources. So in order to avoid the inconvenience and costs associated with the repair or replacement of a failed septic system, you should know how to properly operate and maintain your septic systems. And there's a lot of documentation out there that describes exactly how to do that. Vendors, whenever you purchase a septic system, your vendor always has documentation on how to maintain it, operate and maintain it. When things go wrong, some of the more common septic system problems that we see today are toilets or drains which are backed up or run more slowly than usual. I'm sure everybody's had that problem at one point or another. Foul odor, odors in the house or drinking water. Sogginess in the ground around the septic tank or the leaching bed area. The surface could be flooding with sewage or the septic tank effluent around the septic system. That occurs when a system is either clogged up or overloaded or you've got a broken pipe, wrong size of pump in the tank. It could happen for a number of reasons. Activated alarm signals, lights or bells on special treatment units. They'll bring attention to the fact that there's something wrong. It's always important to keep your, your alarms working properly, especially your lights and your bells and whistles. Dosing pumps. Sometimes they'll run constantly or not at all. That's always a problem. Not all systems have pumps, though. That would apply more to uh, some of the larger systems or some of, some of the advanced treatment systems where they're actually disinfecting they're effluent. Unusually green or thick grass growing around your leaching bed area. That could be an indication that there's an issue. Significant algae growth in or around the nearby lakes or water bodies, another indication. High levels of nitrates, bacteria, or other contaminants in the well water. Could be another indication that there's a problem with your septic system. Yes? Um, Yeah, you don't want them falling into a cesspool or, or into a, a sewage pool or anything like that. That's, that's very dangerous, like by all means. Well, there's, there's always something that can, can be done. It's just a matter of rattling the right cages. <laughs> what, is, what does your EHO say about it? You're kidding. Well, that, that's a problem right there. You've got to get your EHO in there or somebody from Health Canada Department because that's definitely a health issue. If they're made aware of that and they come in and they, they see that, they, would, they could be your strongest advocate for obtaining funding to take corrective action. So I'd start with them. And I mean, 
it all just boils down to it too. If it become if it if it is a health threat and, and God forbid you don't want to wait until somebody becomes injured. You can always go to the media. <laughs> Have somebody come in and do a report on it. You know, nothing speaks louder than uh, a front page or <laughs> front page announcement saying that there's that there's issues. And that's, that's terrible. Which community are you from? Uh, wow. Hmm. Is that a remote? Do you have to fly in there? Wow. Yeah, I'd, I'd be talking to you. Who's your, who is your EHO? Is that, uh, is it uh, the EHO out of Kenora? Sue Lookout. Oh, that's uh, Kevin Lund Lundstrom? Mohammed? Karim? I'm not sure who that would be. Have you had a chance to talk to Amy? Because Amy Montgomery, she presented this morning. She's a EHO supervisor, I believe, out of Thunder Bay here. You know, that's something that you should probably bring to her attention. Well, you should be removing it. I'm actually going to be coming up to that. But it, it depends on, on, on your volume. And the frequency of pumping your sludge depends on, on the volume that you got. If, if you got a lot of sludge coming in, you, you have to pump it more frequently. Well, there's sludge beds, there's drying beds. If, if it's uh, just a uh, strictly sludge, municipal sludge, you can disperse it over the ground in, in a drying bed. But it should be a designated drying bed. Yeah, that's right. So you don't, you don't have anybody playing around there or anybody picking berries or planting or anything like that. <laughs> but we'll, we'll be touching upon that here very shortly. Wow. Some items you flush down a toilet or pour down a drain can significantly reduce the ability of your septic system to work efficiently and effectively. I'm not sure what that is, but uh, it looks like something that's solid. I looked at that photo, I couldn't, it's, yeah, it's probably hair, yeah. <laughs> it's all hair. I don't know. <laughs> Toilets and drains are not garbage cans, as we all know. Harmful chemicals and substances will kill bacteria and render a septic system useless and having to have your system pumped out. Because how do you think uh, chemicals would harm the system? It would kill the bacteria. If you don't have the bacteria, then the bacteria is not going to break down the harmful organisms or the pathogens in your wastewater. How would you know the bacteria died? How would you know? It, uh, it might be a foul smell. You know, a, a system that's working well doesn't smell bad. It, it might be a bit of a musty smell. But if it's starting to smell really bad, you notice that your septic system smells bad? Then that's not right. There's something wrong. You have to grow them again. And that, that could take several weeks. So you'd have to... Chances are you'll, you'll have a lot of the dead bacteria, bugs in your tank. They would settle down to the bottom. So you'd, ideally what you'd want to do is clean out that tank, get rid of all the dead bacteria that's in there, microorganisms, and then and start over. And the way you start over is you just introduce wastewater and, and you it, just let it go. And it takes a few weeks before the bacteria... Well, you, you could stimulate growth. 
there, there, is, there are products out there that will allow you to stimulate bacteria growth and make it happen quicker if you had access to that. There's a lot of products out there, actually. It's not, it's not just one. There's several vendors. Yeah. Yeah, I could see how that would work. That's right, it would help. I've heard of that. Or chicken, even. Raw chicken. Septic systems are not garbage cans. Bulky or hard to break down products can clog pipes. And there's an example of a clogged pipe right there. And the clogged pipe will uh, quickly fill the septic tank and decrease the effectiveness of the system. Septic tank additives, starters may be harmful to septic systems and are not necessary to begin or continue septic tank operation. Some things you should never do with your septic system. Never put the following items or substances into a septic system. <laughs> Fats, oils, and greases. <laughs> A moose, fats, oil, and greases. Deer or wildlife sort of stuff. And that's because it, it can clog the system. Yeah. Gasoline, antifreeze. That'll kill off your bacteria. Varnishes, paints, and solvents. That'll kill off your bacteria. Anything with any chemical component to it. Caustic drain and toilet bowl cleaners. Photographic solutions, bleaches, pesticides. Anything with a chem chemical in it can kill off your bacteria. Nail polish remover, cat box litter, tampons, sanitary napkins. So those are the most common things that clog up septic systems and, and pumps, actually. I've seen more problems with, with tampons and uh, handy wipes, too, clogging up <laughs> pumps. Anybody that's had to pull out a pump just to pull out a handy wipe, they know the anguish. And it's a pain in the ass when it's minus 30 below outside and you have to go to someone's place. Okay, almost done. How much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay. Diapers, paper towels, facial tissues, condoms, plastics, coffee grounds, eggshells, other kitchen waste, or even cigarette filters are all bad for your septic systems. And a lot of these things, too, are organic in nature. You can compost them. Use your compost to spread it across your, your field or your, your garden. The compost, as we all know, is full of nutrients that are great for plants. Tips on maintaining your septic systems. Conserve water. Always try to conserve water and reduce waste flow into the system by installing water saving fixtures and plumbing fixtures. They've got the half flow toilets out there now. You get the option of a half flow or a full flow, depending on whether it's a number one or a number two. You could use dishwater and laundry machines only with full loads. Take shorter showers rather than uh, full baths. Fix leaky faucets or anything that's leaking. Avoid the use of garbage disposal units. Too much water will overload a septic system. More tips on taking care of your system. Ensure that the septic tanks are inspected at least every two years by a qualified person. And pump tanks at least every three to five years or sooner, depending on frequency, which depends on the size of the tank, the size of the home, the number of occupants in the home, number of rooms, on basically the hydraulic load for your wastewater treatment system. Those actions can be combined. Do not impair access to the septic tank so that proper maintenance and servicing can occur. So you want to, at all times, be able to access your septic tanks. 
Reduce the use of phosphate-based detergents, soaps and cleaners. That's to minimize algae growth in nearby lakes and rivers. And as we've all heard and some of us know, phosphates can impair water quality and fish habitat. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you all. Miigwech. Anybody have any questions? Uh, yes, you at the back. <laughs> Didn't you notice I was talking very slowly? <laughs> That's how. <laughs> oh. Before you leave, um, excuse me just a second. Before you guys leave, before you leave, we have a prize for you. Somebody, somebody's chair has something underneath it that says winner, winner. Take a look under your chair. If you're the winner, you get to take home this fine Katie and Tire product. Mastercraft Maximus Screwdriver Set. Is there a winner winner in the house? You might want to check the chairs too that uh, nobody's sitting in, just in case. <laughs> Chris doesn't want to have to take this back home with him. Please, somebody, find the winner winner. <laughs> There we go. Winner, winner. Chicken dinner. Oh. Woo <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. On behalf of the working group, thank you. Thank you. Myself. Should I open it? Oh, it's packed nicely. Thank you, Chris. Um, everybody, if you haven't already, could you also please take the time to 